Okay, House Show 530, I will call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call, please. Okay, sure. Chairman Bob? Here. Vice Chairman Dibble? Here. Commissioner Schrader? Here. Commissioner Zarguni? Here. Commissioner Miller? Here. Commissioner York? Here. Commissioner Gonzalez? Here. Commissioner Mandel is absent. Commissioner and Commissioner Salazar Garza. Here. Quorum Salish. Thank you. Are there any comments at this time to read that do not apply to any of the agenda items? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Andrew Demas with Development Services. The only public comments we have are specific to a zoning case. Thank you. Moving on to approval of absences. Do I hear a motion to? Approve the absence of Commissioner Schrader. Make a motion that we approve the uh, absence for Commissioner Schrader. Michael York, I'll second that. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Moving on to approval of minutes. Do I have a motion or any comments on the minutes? Mr. Commissioner Miller, I move that we approve the meeting minutes as presented by staff. This is Commissioner Salzar Garza, I second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. Moving on to the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, for the record, this is Andrew Demas with Development Services, and I'll be reading in tonight's consent agenda, starting with new plots, item number two. Port Aransas Cliffs, Block 413 and Lots 3A and 3B, a final of 0.321 acres. Item number three, Bayview number two, Block 1, Lot 12R, a final of 0.142 acres. And item number four, Moreland View Preliminary of 24.49 acres. Staff and the TRC have reviewed uh, the plots as listed and have recommended approval. Continuing on the consent agenda under item B, letter B, new zoning, item number five. Uh, the case is 0421-03 ERF Westside Inc. located at 3030 Buffalo Avenue, a request from the CN1 Neighborhood Commercial District CG1 and CG2 General Commercial Districts to the CG1 SP, which is a general commercial district with a special permit. Uh, staff has reviewed the case and recommended approval. That concludes tonight's consent agenda. And if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to address them. Uh, are there any questions for staff regarding items two through five? This is Commissioner Schrader. I have a couple of questions on the, um, the uh, zoning change uh, application. And, and just to interrupt real quick, Commissioner York will be abstaining from item five, just to clarify now. Go ahead, Commissioner Schrader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on the uh, special, um, excuse me, special conditions, uh, it states that there are no soup kitchen or public feedings to be allowed. So essentially, that's what that's saying is, is that the only people uh, who will be served at the uh, dining facility are in residence. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes, sir. They must be in the program of uh, the Good Samaritan. They cannot simply come off the street, grab a meal, and then go back on the street. Once they check in, they are in. And then, um, has uh, what were PD's thoughts, on, or was it discussed that immediately adjacent to this property is a convenience store? Is there any concern as to whether that will be sort of a loitering issue uh, for people? Who that you can't get in, or how does, how does it stay? I know they do a very good job at the current facility for for uh, policing the ground, you know, their, their their area, but um, the adjacent properties is that 
potentially going to be an issue. Uh, well, like, like anything else, Commissioner, there, there could be an issue, but uh, we haven't re received any negative comments from the surrounding property owners or other than one opposition letter, which came from the uh, U.S. Postal Service Union Hall. Uh, but outside of that, there were zero responses in, in opposition to the case. Uh, I do have Captain, or I'm sorry, Chief uh, Shower on the line. I'm sure he can attest specifically to some of those questions about patrolling, but uh, we in zoning do not anticipate any type of negative impact to surrounding properties. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for staff or, or comments? This Michael, you're just a, a question on the, uh, this is Moreland Blue preliminary. Uh, I noticed on where we usually would see a, a, a radius for the right of way, at the intersections or at the 90 degree turns, they're using straight edges, kind of a, a, a chamfer. Is is that something new that staff's doing? Or is that just what they, you know, the way they want, they presented it? Uh, yes, sir. This is, we're simply intaking as presented. Uh, of course, every engineer has their own, uh, I guess, artistic license for lack of a better term. So some will use, uh, some different standards, but all of them were found to be compliant with the UDC and, and TRC did not raise any red flags on it. Okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other comments before I open public hearing on these items? All right, Andrew, at this time, we will open the public hearing for items two through five. Thank you, sir. So, again, the only public notice uh, that was received was from uh, one for the, uh, again, the United States Postal Service Union Hall, which is adjacent to within the 200 feet notice area, or 200 foot notice area, I should say, uh, of the one zoning case for ERF. Now, uh, that only accounts for 0.07% of the opposition uh, ownership. So that, that is well, obviously well below the 20% standard, but uh, that is the only public comment we received via the mail uh, we also have the applicant on the line if there are additional questions. Uh, I believe Mr. Bell is on the line who is representing uh, Good Samaritan and Ed Rochelle Foundation. So if there are any questions the commission wishes to address, uh, he is available for that. Uh, Thank you, Andrew. This is Michael Miller. I had a question for Andrew or for Mr. Bell, whoever wants to answer it. So. Um, so the Good Samaritan will be occupying the old red roof in, and this will be the kitchen component to the uh, to the clients that they're going to serve in the red roof in. Correct. So on on the screen uh, there is a rough site plan which shows. Uh, let me move this one box over, but you'll see that the red roof in site is being used as the. Uh, obviously the residential component and there will be a new building constructed to serve as the kitchen facility so folks would have to come out of the old motel and then walk across the parking lot to get to the new kitchen got it okay yeah this is john bell if i could clarify it the uh the new facility will be both the dining facility as well as the kitchen the entire area, though, will be a fenced, secured area. And so, as was previously noted, uh, this the, the dining facility will be strictly limited just to the residents at the facility. This will not be an open soup kitchen of any sort. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Any other questions for the applicant or any other comments from the applicant? Well, I would just like to uh, state that on behalf of the Ed Rochelle Foundation and the Good Samaritan uh, Rescue Mission, this is really a critical site for this facility. As some of you may recall, we've uh, tried previously, and, uh, and this is a really an exceptional location. It will provide adequate room and, uh, and space and facilities for the folks at the Good Samaritan Rescue Mission to continue doing what they're doing. It, uh, it's really an exceptional service that's provided in Corpus Christi, and we expect that it should be enhancing not only this neighborhood, but also other areas in town that uh, are 
that have difficulties with the homeless population. But uh, this will help get people off the street, keep them off the street, and get them into much more productive, much more productive employment. Thank you for that. I do applaud their their efforts, and and I do agree this is a, a good location. I was on the commission when the last couple have come through. So, any other comments for the applicant or anybody else on the line wishing to comment on this item? Uh, no, sir, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the city, we have no additional comments that have been sent to us. No problem. At this time, I will close the public hearing portion and. I will need further discussion on items two through five or separate motions, items two through four, and then item five with Commissioner York abstaining. This is Michael York. I make a motion we approve items two, three, and four as presented by staff. Thank you. Do I have a second? Mr. Commissioner Sponsor. I'll second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Uh, item five, do I have a motion for item five? This is Commissioner Zarguni. I make a motion that we approve it as presented by staff. Commissioner Miller, I second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for item five. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion passes. Thank you all for your comments on that. Moving on to item uh, six. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, for the record, Andrew Demas with Development Services. And first, we're going to address the, it's West, uh, let me go back to the agenda, Westwood Heights Unit 4. This is a final of 9.06 acres on this plot. And what they are appealing is the staff determination of plat expiration as a result of insufficient progress on construction of improvements. So uh, I'm sure you, all of you have had an opportunity to read the memo, but I'll go through the highlights. Uh, essentially, the plat expired on November 13th of 2020. And on our timeline here, we have it broken down of uh, a uh, date of original plat received back on 820 of 19. A uh, first time extension that was granted in May of last year. Uh, second time, ex uh, second time extension we never received. So at the end of the six month time extension in November of 2020, in November of 2020, that is when the plaque expired. And without receiving any type of notification from the applicant or proof of sufficient progress on either public improvements or construction or something, uh, the plat remains expired. So at this point, the applicant is appealing this statement to state that uh, they would like their plat, of course, renewed. And now again, just to uh, notify Planning Commission, even if Planning Commission is grants the approval of the appeal, the six month deadline starts from November. So essentially the applicant is buying about three weeks of time before May and they're having to then resubmit another uh, potential time extension, or if Planning Commission denies the request based on the staff findings, uh, then they would the applicant would need to resubmit their plat and start the process over. We go back through the technical review committee, just like every other plat that's submitted to us. But so going back through our staff findings. Uh, again, we found that no sufficient progress occurred when it came to submitting construction plans uh, or approved by a deadline by staff of December 15 of 20. Construction has not been initiated. The plot expired again as a result of insufficient progress on number four. The, an option to the applicant is to resubmit their expired plot. And again, the plot expired back on Tuesday, November 13th of last year. Uh, staff is recommending denial of the appeal. And if there's any questions uh, of staff, we'd be more than happy to address them. Thank you, Andrew. Are there any comments for staff at this time? I, I see that, uh, I think I recall Andrew in there somewhere that you indicated that the applicant has also stated that they will not be prepared to move forward with this until November of this year. Is that is that correct? That is correct. That it was information was a conversation between city staff and the owner 
Uh, and this past week, I confirmed that with the uh, applicant's engineer that yes, they would not be ready until November of this, uh, this coming November, I should say. Typically, how long is the, if, if they're restarting the process, typically how long is that, does that process take? So it's a great question. So the state of Texas has a mandatory 30 day shot clock when it comes to plots. Uh, by virtue of knowing that this plot has already gone through the process once, uh, it would have to go back through the TRC again for review, but from date of complete submittal, we would look at starting the clock to make sure that he's back in front of the planning commission within 30 days, assuming no changes have been made to his plot to where he would trigger any additional TRC comments. If he alters the plot in any way, it's not essentially a re-review of what he's already submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? At this time, Andrew, I'll open the public hearing for item number six. Thank you, sir. Uh, we don't, uh, we didn't receive any type of mailed in uh, comments or phone calls. I believe the applicant is on the line. Uh, I do see someone labeled Westwood Heights. Uh, so I have no further comment if uh, you want to open it to any of the call ins uh, on the list. Thank you. Are there any other callers that would like to comment on item six regarding the Westwood Heights unit four appeal? Uh, yeah, it's just not needs our duty, though. Uh, Andrew, I think you forgot to mention that I did pay for the extension last November, and you or Mr. Mark failed to put it on the on the board. Yes, sir. So the rule of the UDC says that it must be submitted within seven days. The request that was submitted was submitted four days before the deadline, so it was not submitted in a timely manner. Well, I followed what Mr. Mark told me, Orozco. That's yes, sir. We're, we're, we are, we're following what's stated in the UDC, which is our adopted code. Okay. So what do you... you for that. Thank you for that comment, uh, sir. It's good to know that that was attempted. So any other, any other comments for us, please? No, I don't have a... No other comments? No, sir. Okay, it do, I, I, I had read the report as well. I understand that it was uh, some reimbursements from the city that you were looking for. Uh, COVID uh, also seems to be a big topic of, of construction right now. Um, and then I know construction was not starting till, till November is basically how we saw that. Is that all about correct? Yes, yes. sir, that it was explained to us in the applicant's letter that there were some delays of construction costs, and of course, you know, COVID has delayed everything uh, globally. So, uh, yes, that was in his appeal letter. Great. Thank you. All right. Are there any other comments from anybody else on the phone regarding item six? At this time, I will close the public hearing and entertain additional comments from Planning Commission, questions, or a motion. <laughs> I think some of my thoughts on it are, are it was it was trying to be you know paid. I understand that there's still some some hardships and there's still some time for them to want to uh, build it. I don't know you know how much time and effort and cost there is in resubmitting. Um, I, I definitely see people resubmitting five and six times and, and not missing deadlines. Obviously, so um, you know I, I just some thoughts I had. I don't I don't openly have an issue with the appeal or, or granting an extension, knowing that it ought to be another extension shortly. So at this time, I will make a motion to um, to grant the appeal opposite the um, city's request to deny. Is there a second? Michael York, I'll second that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes, the appeal is approved. Andrew, is that clarified? Yes, sir, and just, just for the record, so in case this comes up in, at a future meeting, this, this clock started back on November 13th. So the six months that this appeal will grant in lieu of a time extension started on November 13th of 20 and will expire 
uh, on May 13th. So uh, the, owner, the owner and the applicant are still on the line. Please, if you're going to, obviously don't let this expire in three weeks again. Uh, if you wish to file for a time extension, please do so at least a week before the deadline so you're, you're kosher with the code. Uh, if we, you know that you're not gonna have construction begin until November of this year. So uh, just please do me that favor so we're not presenting another appeal in four weeks. Agreed, thank we'll, you for that clarification, Andrew. Will do, yes, sir. Thank you. All righty, moving on to item number seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so moving on to item number seven, which is our other zoning case of the night. The uh, official name of the case is the estate of Hart F. Smith and Juliana Dunn. Let me pull this up on the screen for everyone to see. So the request is from the RE uh, Residential Estate District and CG2 General Commercial District. Uh, I'm sorry, to the CG2 and RM2 CG, uh, General Commercial District and Multifamily District. The location of the subject property, those familiar with, of course, the Corpus Christi area is located in Flower Bluff. The property is just south of the Walmart, which is at the intersection of SPID and Flower Bluff Drive, as you can see on the center of the screen. Moving on to the next slide here is a closer view of the subject property. As you can see, the proposed general commercial portion is along uh, the Flower Bluff Drive frontage and the remainder of the property is for the RM2 district. As far as zoning pattern is concerned, we have, uh, of course, the commercial corridor along SPID. Uh, those of you who know, Flower Bluff was annexed in 1961, so you do have various phases of zoning that occurred. Of course, the original zoning in 61, there was a large area-wide rezoning done in 1983. And then with the adoption of the ACUS in 85, you'll see all of those kind of post zonings that occurred after the fact, pushing more to the CG1 district because our CG1 district historically does not allow any type of residential use. Now, here's another view of the air installation compatibility use zone map. Uh, as mentioned in our staff report, while the property is technically not within the APZ layer, which stands for accident potential zone, at its closest point, it is roughly 60 feet away from the line. So the ACUS is a guideline that we use in, in zoning cases, whether they are in an APZ or accident potential zone or outside of it, because as uh, we've always been told by the Navy when you're when you're flying, of course, there are no paint lines in the sky to tell you to stay inside the line. So it is still a matter of public safety. And based on the comments that we received back from the Navy on this particular case, they are not in favor of recommending this change of zoning uh, for that very reason. Even again, but I want to just make sure it's clear: this is not in an ACUS, an accident potential zone, but it is pretty close, 60 feet at its closest point. So th that is still a concern. Moving on to the next slide, which addresses UDC requirements. There are some small buffer yards that will be required based on adjacency to other zoning districts, primarily the adjacency to the RE residential estate uh, to the south. There are two different setbacks, of course, one for the RM2 multifamily district and one for the CG2 general commercial. Uh, the uses that are allowed are pretty standard. You can have single family and multifamily within the RM2 district, as well as you can have multifamily retail uh, and the common uses in the CG2 general commercial district. Of course, key phrase in CG2 is that it does allow residential, which again is that concern with adjacency to ACUs. As far as utilities are concerned, all utilities are available to the site. Moving down to notification area, we received uh, the 34 notices mailed out. We received two in opposition, which is roughly almost two and a half percent and two in favor. There are also eight uh, letters that were mailed into us, or I should say emailed to us uh, that are outside of the notification area. And when we get to the public hearing portion, I will read those into the record. Now, based on the information submitted to us on the, from the application, staff is recommending denial for two main reasons. One is the inconsistency with the future land use map, the Flower Bluff Area Development Plan and Plan CC. The future land use map calls that the area should remain low density residential, which is the most current adopted map. 
Secondly, the proximity to the ACUs and uh, reading the original application submitted to us, it did state within the land use statement, as mentioned in my staff report, uh, construction between five and 600 apartment units, which is well above something that the Navy or the city would be comfortable with, again, that close to the accident potential zones. So for that reason, we are recommending denial. Now, the, I believe the applicant has an alternative proposal, which they did submit to us. It is on a following slide, which uh, when we get to the, again, the portion of the public hearing, I will let the applicant go ahead and introduce that alternative proposal, which does talk about various levels of density when it comes to the application or to the uh, potential change of zoning. But as I mentioned in my staff report under department comments, even under this, and I'll give you a quick preview, even under this alternative proposal, it is still generating 615 dwelling units total. So even if you step down your RM2 to RM1 and have kind of a, a split zoning among four or five different districts, you're still generating at maximum build out of 615 dwelling units. So I just wanted to make that clear uh, before, you know, of course, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to address them at this point. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, this vice chairman devil i guess i've just got a question on denial due to proximity to the aq zone i mean you know philosophically either you're in the accident potential zone or you're not and i mean i get it at 60 feet but then what's to say next time staff says well it's within 500 feet of the the accident potential zone so we're going to recommend denial i mean i think um those lines are drawn for a reason, and 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 I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, yes, there's no lines in the sky, but you know, I would imagine the further you get from the center line, the less likelihood is that there's going to be an accident. And so I just, um, at least for me, I've got a problem with the staff recommending a denial when it's outside the zone just just want to go on record for that thank you any other questions for staff at this time yeah this is michael york so this changing obviously this was said it was planned for low density residential so with the with the change to multifamily and the addition of all you know it's a lot more dense. How, how did staff look at the impacts to the uh, infrastructure? So specifically sewer capacity and, and then also water capacity. Or, are there concerns about being able to serve this with, with sewer? I know there's sewer lines available, but you're adding that many units. If this was planned for low density, you're sending a lot more flow to that system. Did, did the utilities department have comments on that? I did leave a, a few phone calls with the utilities department. Uh, the, the conversation that I had was that there is a 10 inch PVC line along Compton Road, and that would be more than likely the line to be extended to this site. Uh, of course, we won't get into the nitty gritty, the details until the platting phase. At face value, 10 inches should be able to serve this entire area. But again, the calculations won't be run uh, until that plat portion of the project. Andrew this, is, Andrew, this is Michael Miller. Has um, has Ben Pollock had a chance to review the proposed um, uh, shifting of the of the zoning that that's on that last slide? Yes, sir. He sure did. Uh, we went over the original submittal as well as the alternative submittal. Uh, his comments have been on behalf of the Navy to not recommend the change of zoning, either the original or the uh, alternative proposal. Has been on the line to to uh, further explain the Navy's position. Yes, I believe, yes, I believe so. He is with us. Yeah, this is this is Ben Bullock, ex officio member of the Planning Commission for the Navy. Um, yeah, I kind of want to address both uh, the close proximity of the AQs. Yes, the their the student pilots. They're definitely always going to be the spill out outside of the APC two, but also to. There are direct flight paths or flight tracks that cross 
to subject property uh, that are transitions back from the Walden airfield to the main airfield. Also, too, when we're in the north, uh, north configure, north and south configuration, uh, depending on the number of aircraft that are in the bounce pattern, uh, the APZ will extend beyond where it normally is located. So, uh, not only are we concerned about the, the noise levels for the multitude of residents that are going to have to hear G6s coming back from Waldron, also, you know, the possibility of uh, having another Oceana where you, know, you had an F-18 crash into an apartment building and kill multiple people. So because of those reasons, that's why we're recommending against it. And I can tell you that the, uh, the new AQs for Waldron and Cabinets has come out. I got it today. There was a noise technical review for the actual main base that we're speaking of right now. The accident potential zones are not changing. Uh, for the main airfield here, but uh, still the concerns of the direct flight paths and the spillouts are the reason we're going to recommend no. And I, I have some questions from a historical perspective. Um, Andrew, do you have the ability to pull up when um, the Walmart and that um, four story um, motel? So that, that zoning is 1961 and 1995? That's correct, sir. And when they went in for a permit, um, I mean, there, there wasn't any, what, what happens when whenever something is, um, is zoned, like let's say that 1961, and you go in for permit and, you know, you're going to build a, you know, relatively high, you know, a, a development that's going to have a, the potential of having a lot of people in it at any given time, and it's within an APZ. What what happens in that uh, scenario? That, that's a great question. That's uh, actually been kind of the discussion of the day on some other properties. So when a property is zoned by, by state statute, they are granted all of the uses that the municipality will allow under that zoning district. And the, that is regardless if it sits under an APZ one, a clear zone, what have you, they are entitled to those rights uh, and, and development standards under that zoning district. So a retail use, regardless of size, uh, even if we, I personally don't like it, the zoning district grants the right. So for Walmart, for example, is zone CG one general commercial, that allows a retail use without restriction. There are no floor area ratios. There are no height limitations uh, when it comes to a non-residential use. So that is allowed to go in there, even if common sense says we shouldn't put something that has that much density uh, under an APZ uh, accident potential zone. So that's step one. Step two would be, of course, uh, we did not adopt ACUS as a guideline, and that's the other half, is that ACUS in our code today, uh, as far as the UDC, it is just used as a guideline. It is not a codified regulation, meaning I cannot cite someone and say, sorry, you are an APZ2, you're not entitled to this use based on the size of it. Uh, it was only adopted back in 2011 as part of the UDC as a guideline to be used in the event of a rezoning. Uh, of course, we do bring it up at every early assistance, pre-development meeting that if a property is with an APZ, uh, it is best that they speak with the Navy and then consult with them, especially on the long-term exposure of noise contours. Uh, of course, that also uh, brings in lighting standards. So uh, zoning is not the only time that we will bring up the ACUS issue, but again, I have to make it extremely clear, it is only to be used as a guideline. Once zoning is out the door and it is granted as general commercial, uh, the, the, that's it. That's our only chance. So that's why Walmart and the hotel were built because those uses were allowed under that standard at the time they were constructed and still are today. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Uh, this is Commissioner Schrader. I guess I um, I want to kind of follow on to that a little bit because. The, let's say that the Walmart site was not CG1, but was, you know, uh, farm rural or, you know, something that hadn't been developed. 
in a uh, in, is it is uh, I guess really this question is for Mr. Pollock. Is the Navy's position on these things just anything that has the potential for a density of people? Is that the basis for how you all recommend or don't recommend what's what's uh, built in one of these uh, areas or adjacent areas? Yeah, the uh, so, so what we follow is the APUS guideline that's set forth by the Department of the Navy. What should be recommended in APZ ones and APZ two. So, uh, de determining you know what's going on in those cases, we will then look and then try to determine what's the best use. Yes, the, the main focus is the safe, uh, you know, safety of the people, health and welfare. So that's what we worry about the most. And I, I guess I can see Andrew kind of pulling up the guidelines on what we determine. Yeah. What should be used in there? And if you really look at it, um, you know, APZ one should not have any of this. Um, Andrew talked about the joint land use study. It's when the city adopted uh, our AQs. Uh, that was, you know, not long ago. I mean, we actually had the 2009 is when our AQs came out, and the city uh, adopted this one. And now we have a refresh, and we plan to do that again. So, uh, you know, without the city's commitment to try to Look at what our new AQ say and try to rezone uh, different parcels. Uh, we really would have such a big, huge problem in the incompatible development. And I know there's a lot of things out there that you know people will look at and go, "Wow, you know, we're we're trying to get rid of an apartment here, but there's a hotel right in front of it." A lot of that stuff was done before the adoption, of the joint land use study, and the coordination and the. Uh, the uh, relationship between the city and the Navy. I, I certainly, no, I certainly understand that. So th this helps a lot. The uh, so essentially, uh, eight. I mean, in this area we're talking about is there. It's not recommended to build anything that would be occupied. Then, I mean, in other words, effectively, I mean, the, the desire is to have open land. Uh, or I guess warehouses or something maybe in all in all of these. Uh, and so my next question is, um, is there anything that, you know, the, the discussion in this case is obviously a, the fact that, you know, that this is on near the line. Um, I mean, it's, it's, so when you go beyond, you know, when you go beyond that, um, it's kind of like, which has, I mean, a lot of, in a lot of ways, the, from an odd standpoint, more of these flights are during the day when a Walmart might be full and an apartment complex may be, most people may be at work. It may actually be lower density um, and it's technically outside the zone. So it's a real challenge for us to try to, you know, stretch this uh, zone out over, and I realize it's just a line, but it's like, you know, how do we, What's the best way for us to to use that? And it's I mean, I, it's easy to see rationalizing this both ways, and it not be that much that wrong in either case. Now, I, I completely understand, Andrew. Would you go up to the top there, please, of the uh, zoning? So, obviously, what really the Navy's rec uh, not recommending is the max the the max density, the medium to high density. Now, if you look over there single units detached we can do maximum density of one one to two dwellings per acre so there is some leeway in trying to build housing in that area that's closer to you know behind the commercial on that area so there are different types of things that we could use for that and you know yes it is outside the apc2 and once again i andrew said it as well this is only a recommendation from the navy on you know what we would like to see on there. And that's another reason, obviously, ex officio member not non voting. So it's really the planning commissioners calls on this. We just want to put our in input in and annotate, you know, what, you know, we agree or disagree on for any type of stuff in the future. So, uh, but if you can go down that, uh, if you go down this chart here and there are different things, uh, you know, max floor to air ratios, 
uh, in depending on APZ, APZ one or two. So um, there are other options out there. We're just recommending against the medium to um, heavy residential area there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pollock. Anything else for staff before we open the public hearing? Yes, Michael York, I've got one more question. So for, for zoning cases, uh, usually they have to fill out a peak hour traffic form trying to show, you know, to show if, if what the impact will be. Can, do you have that information and were they required to do a traffic impact analysis or, or did, did that form show that the increase in traffic is not going to be substantial enough to warrant a study? Uh, you, uh, you're breaking my heart. So they're, they're, yes, they're, the, today the UDC reads that in order to justify requiring a traffic impact analysis, a TIA, the threshold is 501 peak trips, AM or PM. Uh, and that's, that's an awful high bar to hit. I don't think even Schlitterbahn hit that mark. When this application was submitted along with the peak hour trip form, the maximum, the highest peak hour value that was shown on that form was 478 peak hour trips. So it is, it is a hair below the 501 threshold. But it's, it's kind of like the old saying: if there's feathers and there's quacking, it, it sounds like a duck. There's that many trips, but technically, it does not meet the 501 threshold to qualify for a TIA. We're at 478. Okay, so. Just out of curiosity, then, so I assume if if a if an impact study were required, they would perform that study, and that would tell the city if classifications of road needed to be, you know, made greater and, and that kind of thing. How will that exactly be? acceleration? XL decel lanes. Uh, if the uh, right turn, uh, left center turn lanes would need to be installed. Any type of traffic mitigation, sidewalks, all of those things would need to be addressed. If a TIA was required, you're correct, sir. Okay, thank you. But one last thing I wanted to throw in as, as just part of the presentation, it, just because this property is adjacent to ACUS, and, and as you can see, this is the chart we go through when determining compatibility, does not mean the property is useless or that it has to remain open land. Uh, a few years ago, we did create the compatible districts and it was a kind of a pet project of mine to come up with two compatible districts, one for commercial, one for industrial uses, that would take the elements out of that table you just saw for the ACUS chart and show that all of these uses are allowed in these districts. So it does not render this land, uh, that it must remain open land, that it, it can have legitimate businesses that do generate storage and warehousing and all types of commercial industrial uses the goal is that it just doesn't congregate large amounts of people. That is the key phrase. Uh, Andrew, this is Dan Dibble again. And sorry, I, I got lost connection and had to uh, uh, re-access the meeting. So I missed a couple of minutes. But just to be clear, this side is totally out of either the AP1 or the AP2 or AP2 zones, correct? Yes, sir. It is technically outside of the accident potential zones. Okay. Thank you. All right, Andrew, at this time, I will open the public hearing for comments. If you want to read the emails first, and then we'll go to the callers. Yes, sir. That, that would be just fine. So uh, starting off with Paul Keller Investments, uh, this was submitted in favor of the change of zoning. This is property owner number 31 on the, let me pull back up the map, uh, just so we're all on the same page. So property owner number 31 registered their vote in favor. The second is Todd Horn, property owner number eight, who also recommends uh, or submits a comment of in favor. James E. Cass and Teresa Cass, who are property owner number two, they are in opposition and they attached a letter, which they asked me nicely to go ahead and read to the record, which says, Please update our previous letter of opposition to cover the modified proposal. We own and reside on residential property within 200 feet of the Smith property. We remain opposed to the modified proposal of April 8, 2021, related to the proposed rezoning of the Hart Smith and Juliana Dunn Smith property for the same reasons as opposed to the original letter. 
In addition, the high pressure pipeline should be considered at this point rather than at the point of plotting since the existence of a very old high pressure and high volume pipeline is potentially dangerous and therefore should preclude zoning for high density residential dwellings. It seems improper for a modified proposal to be considered without sending fresh formal notices to all residential property owners within one half mile of the Smith property. The effect of this proposal is significant to the entire residential neighborhood, not just the property owners within 200 feet. I believe you must treat all opposition to the original proposal as remaining opposition to the modified proposal. Thank you. The next uh, notice is from property owner number 11, Mr. Acuna, who has uh, simply checked the box in opposition. And then the following are outside of the 200 foot notification area, but for the reasons of transparency, I will uh, absolutely read into the record. Uh, this one is from Barbara Kilgore, who states, I live at 1659 Graham Road, and I am in opposition to the rezoning of the property uh, by the Hart F. Smith and Juliana Dunn Smith rezoning case. Ours is a very quiet family neighborhood in which we would feel compromised by this rezoning. In addition, I would not like to see the city in conflict with the Navy base and the rezoning would cause problems similar to what the school district experienced. I can guarantee that the training planes fly directly over this property. The reason I know this is because they fly directly over my house and to turn and cross that property to return to base. From previous experiences, I am aware that the Navy only wants single family dwellings, no apartments or concentration of people in one area. I hope you consider my concerns. This would not be appropriate rezoning. Moving on to the next notice from Mr. Frank Hagler. The proposed rezoning of the Smith Estate to allow high density housing very near both Grand Road and Whitner Place is inappropriate. My property was purchased for very specific reasons. It is a semi-rural one acre property surrounded by other semi-rural one acre plus size properties. We want privacy, quiet, a cul-de-sac and safety. Adding high density housing to this area not only significantly devalues existing and long-standing properties, but will have non-trivial impacts upon the neighborhood's privacy, noise level, and it's very likely its safety. These changes are wholly unacceptable and incongruent with the established zoning in the area. Clearly, there are more suitable locations in Flower Block to not border larger tracts of land that host well-established families and valuable homes. Additionally, water access points and privacy along Oso Bay shoreline are concerned. The Oso Bay is a protected wetland environment. Currently, there is no virtually uh, there is virtually no foot traffic along its naturally reedy and muddy eastern shoreline. The shoreline of this fragile ecosystem with its reeds and small mangroves traps trash easily. Oh. I've only seen two people walking in it the last few years. The addition of high density housing to the proposed location may change both the number of people on the shoreline and the amount of trash significantly for the worse. I have seen a wide variety of wildlife utilizing this area and, and a significant number of cranes. One uh, may have even been a whooping crane, but I cannot be absolutely positive of that. To summarize, for my family, we strongly oppose allowing high density housing to negatively impact the well-established nature of our community, especially without neighborhood approval. Thank you for your time. The next letter is from Susan Lutka. My husband, Larry Lutka, and I live at 1631 Graham Road, which is approximately 730 feet from the Smith property in question. We stand firmly in opposition to this rezoning for apartment use since apartments are contrary to the existing single family use on the south and east side of the Smith property. We bought our property approximately 30 years ago, and of course, things have changed and homes have been built. Houses have been built on Graham Road on both sides of Flower Bluff Drive, on Whitner Drive, and Cantera Trail. All of this is expected, but has followed the RE designation of the area. To inject apartments into this residential area makes a mockery of any type of zoning consistency. We purchased our homes based on the residential plan outlined for future development. Using the parcel in question as residential estate for use as Compton and Cantera have done is consistent with the neighborhood. We firmly oppose this rezoning to develop apartments. Other potential issues are gas pipelines that purportedly run under and near the property and traffic congestion that already exists on Flower Bluff Drive near Compton Road and the Murphy's gas station entrance at the Walmart entrance. Traffic is an uncontrolled disaster in this area with multiple accidents and at least one fatality that I know of and additional traffic from two to 300 apartment units will be extremely dangerous. I am sure that Councilman Smith would not like apartments and commercial development further down Flower Bluff Drive in his neighborhood. And I'm also sure that he chose to live where he can enjoy the benefits of residential estates neighborhoods. Our neighborhoods deserve the same consideration, consistency and respect. Please be present. I'll please present this at the rezoning hearing. And let me know if you receive this letter. Thank you. Uh, which we did notify that we received the letter. Uh, next letter is from Amarita Wrights. 
Good morning, Mayor Wajardo. My name is Amarita Wrights, and I'm sending you this email to introduce myself. I purchased Joe Adame's home in Flower Bluff on Graham Road. I heard you know the home and you are a Flower Bluff Hornet, as well as my three children will be in the near future. We're excited to be here in Corpus Christi. I, too, would like to offer my help to promote projects of preservation and quality of life. I have just met with my neighbors here on Graham Road and the surrounding streets. As we are unpacking the large truck, new friends and neighbors wandered over to introduce themselves to the neighborhood. I was made aware of a huge apartment complex and a commercial space being planned right next to our home. I'm writing this, uh, writing a long letter this evening to include you on this email regarding the impact of the Oso Bay, our wetlands, and the Flower Bluff School District. I have a vision about the land next to us being developed into potential wildlife and sea life sanctuary, perhaps possibly rehab center for injured animals, and a place that celebrates our unique biosphere. Serving the local area, Texas Parks and Wildlife, as well as other agencies could bring injured animals to a future facility. Thoughts and dreams just to start. I am reaching out to the potential partners to make it, this facility a reality and hearing that of high density apartments and commercial spaces would take away a premier wetland area. Such a use is not in keeping with the neighborhood and its connection to wildlife. Thank you. Moving on to the next letter from Carl Falsey. We remained opposed to the modified proposal of April 8, 2021 related to the proposed rezoning of the Hart Smith and Julianne Dunn Smith property for the same reasons that we opposed the original proposal. In addition, the high pressure pipeline should be considered at this point rather than at the point of platting since the existence of the very old high pressure line is potentially dangerous. Thank you. Next is from Calvin Monty. I am a homeowner at 1643 Graham Road. I am opposed to the rezoning of the property at the, of the estate of Hart F. Smith. If the priority of follow up residence should be put foremost above all else, the rezoning would not happen. These are several reasons I believe this. It is too close to the Navy base where they do practice flights, reference the accident near Orange Grove with the Navy pilots. If there were apartments, uh, residents in this place where the accident like this happened, you can only imagine the children and others that would be hurt or worse yet killed. Number two, this has been an area where residents own single family homes. Most have just bought these homes for privacy reasons. Number three, the traffic that would increase with the amount of apartments would be terrible. The oncoming traffic from SPID and Flower Bluff Road would be impeded. The residents, if this were to be approved, would have a hard time leaving due to traffic. Number four, there are old pipelines that can be very dangerous if not checked out properly. And number five, in general, I am opposed to this rezoning. Thank you. Uh, we just have a, a two letters to go. So uh, next letter is from Jack North. By evidence of this letter, I am opposed to the proposal of April 8, 2021 related to the change of zoning on the above reference property of the estate of Hart F. Smith. And then lastly, this is from Michelle uh, Sconey. My name is Michelle Sconey and my family and I live at 1701 Whitner, Corpus Christi, Texas. We remain opposed to the modified proposal of April 8th. Uh, related to the proposed rezoning of the Hart F. Smith and Juliana Dunn Smith property uh, for the same reasons that we opposed the original. Please do not rezone the property. Thank you. And that concludes all of the mail notices uh, sent to us concerning this zoning case. Thank you for bearing with me as I read those in. Thank you, Andrew. At this time, we will, um, do we have the applicant on the line? Yes, sir, I believe so. Uh, Mr. Bell would still be on the line. Yes, uh, yes. my name is John Bell, and uh, I represent the applicants who are uh, Burton Smith, Brent Smith, Greg Smith, and Linda Reed. And involved, of course, is a prospective purchaser of this property and that it is under contract. And uh, before we get into the alternative proposal, I was wondering, Andrew, could you pull up the ACUS map that I sent you from the city's records? Uh, it's not in your presentation. No, it's a citywide AQs map. I've got oh, it. Yes, sir. I've got it here if I could share, but whichever is easier. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and switch channels. I don't think it just got pasted over to this folder. Uh, is this a, does this enable everyone to see the AQs map for the city? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to point out is clearly this area is 
ranging from 50 feet to 500 feet outside the ACUS area. And, um, and you know, we, we have to apply it fairly so far as what is an area and what is not. But we have to keep in mind also that this particular ACUS 2 area already is 3,000 feet wide. It is over a half a mile wide. And as you can see, it is double the width and in some cases triple the width of the existing ACUS 2 areas and the other parts of the city, uh, the widest ones being at NAS uh, Corpus Christi. But when you look at the perimeter fields, there are even a third of the width of this ACUS. So we're not discussing a problem like existed in CCISD where they were considering building a school that was right at the end of a termination of an ACUS area. But we're talking about a property that's outside the, laterally outside the boundary of the ACUS area that's already 3,000 feet wide. It's difficult to envision any study that would warrant widening this area more, but the reality of the situation today is that it is clearly outside the area. And, and that's, that's the only picture I wanted to show that was other than that. Now we could go back to the, uh, the alternative plan that we've developed. If we could, so do I have to unshare or do something? Great. No, sir, all set. Okay, if we could take a look at the alternative plan, there was never any intention for us to do all RM2. And uh, the plan from the beginning was to have a mixed uses in the back, uh, ranging back to the RS22 at the rear of the property on Oso Bay, and, uh, but having apartments immediately behind the commercial area. It's important to keep in mind then, so far as that peak traffic count, the 478 was calculated based upon all 35 and a half acres being RM2. Obviously the peak traffic counts come down dramatically when we come up with this alternative plan. The developer does not want to do high density housing at this development. What we're seeking is a, a composite of about 25 units per acre for nice residential housing. The reality is Flower Bluff has zero apartments today that are class A apartments. The last apartments built in Flower Bluff were more than 30 years old. I was involved in the wharf apartments across SPID that were built in 1983 before uh, the ACUS was developed. But we have, we have a, a good housing shortage in Flower Bluff and the Navy, to the people we've talked to the Navy would dramatically benefit from having class A uh, housing, apartment housing, uh, available in Flower Bluff. Now uh, their students have to drive all the way to the deep south side of Corpus Christi or to the island in order to have this type of housing. This is one location, the only location in Flower Bluff that has the existing utilities. It has an existing arterial street improved Flower Bluff Drive that's already there thanks to the Walmart and is improved uh, to standards that there would be no real significant need for infrastructure. It's the only seat, only only site of this nature that could actually support this type of development in Flower Bluff. And so it's critical for us to keep in mind that this area uh, can be allowed for development. It's uh, ready for development and, uh, and it's outside the ACUS area. Now, there has to be a reasonable transition between the Walmart and the two high-rise hotels uh, uh, along SPID to uh, a low-density residential area. And half-acre lots, two houses per acre, is super low-density housing in Corpus Christi. I realize that the Fire Bluff Development Plan is still under consideration at this point, but any consideration of uh, comprehensive planning techniques should recognize this as being a prime location for development of some better transition than half acre lots between some of the most dense commercial corridor and all of Flower Bluff and what is a partially developed residential area to the south. Uh, when the comprehensive plan says we want to encourage orderly growth and, and one other comment about or orderly growth, 
the zoning for this area actually dates all the way back to annexation of Flower Bluff. It was a residential estate then. It was the Smith family homestead of uh, 40 acres, and it hasn't changed from the time that before it was even part of Corpus Christi. And so what we're really looking at here is, is coming up with a, a, a well-developed plan for the development of this property and that we want to encourage mixed use development. We want to encourage transitions. We want to uh, consider the ACUs, but not deny a property that's clearly outside ACUs. And we want to consider the overall need for the Navy as well. When you look at this area, the, the boxes uh, are the developer's best idea of what, what, would, what could be developed. The, the acreages are gross, I would point out. We've also indicated the net acres. And that please keep in mind when we're zoning, we're going to be rezoning gross acres. But when a developer actually pulls a building permit, the number of apartments or the number of single family residences or townhouses that can be built will be limited by the number of net acres that are there after the street. Now, after looking at this site, because of the irregular shape on the north side, the only real place for the street to go is the south. And so far as the buffer with the residential area to the south, we already have a 140 foot wide drainage right of way that separates it. Plus we'd have a 60 foot street right of way that would be separating this area from what currently is an undeveloped tract of land immediately to the south. The developer would like to develop 500 to 600 units. And so in order to get that, we'd have a blend of RM2 and RM1 zoning uh, of um, uh, 11.64 acres for RM2 and 15.61 for RM1. And this is not high density residential zoning. This would be medium density residential zoning uh, in order to get those, uh, those apartments. The rest of the track could be townhomes, and then we would have the RS-22 at the rear of the property along Oso that would be consistent with the other residences along the Oso uh, going further south. It's, uh, the critical thing is to add up the acreage to 39.92 acres. We have no problem with the staff's recommendation for CG1 on the front of uh, 4.12 acres. That is fine, uh, it makes sense, it's consistent with the area, but in order for uh, this property to be developed, it, it would be a colossal waste of the city's resources by having an improved arterial street, by having the water and the sewer. This is one of the few places in Flower Bluff with existing wastewater capacity to accommodate these apartment units, it would be a tremendous waste of city resources to deny the zoning for apartments on the limited extent requested. And then of course, it's a tremendous waste of private property to deny a reasonable use for property that is outside the ACUS area, that is a transition property between a Walmart and a Murphy Oil Company and several high-rise hotels to a residential area below, south of it. So this area should be a more dense area as a transition in order to go from that super dense uh, commercial area along SPID to what will be a, a single family area to the south. It's naturally separated by this drainage way we think all of the planning, uh, comprehensive planning guidelines are fulfilled by uh, a layout that, it, that is something along these lines. We respectfully request that you use the gross acreages that we've listed there. Obviously, if the Planning Commission believes uh, something uh, should be adjusted, uh, I've been authorized by, the, by my clients to discuss that with you tonight but we need to have something more than half acre lots for this property to be developed properly and efficiently and for the city's resources to be used properly and efficiently. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. 
and uh, other members of the family and the developer are also on the line this evening. Thank you, Mr. Bill. At, at this time, I will continue um, the public hearing portion of it before we continue asking questions. So um, are there any other callers that wish to speak at this time? Any other callers wishing to speak on item seven? Okay, any uh, questions from the Planning Commission to Mr. Bell? If I could make one additional point about the pipeline, according to urban engineering, this is not a high pressure gas pipeline. It's a relatively low pressure pipeline and, and the planning for this site has taken that into consideration. Uh, uh, layouts can easily be done, and as you can see on this site plan, it can be accommodated. Thank you, sir. All right, at this time, I will close the public uh, hearing portion of item seven and entertain further discussion or a motion. I have, um, Mr. Commissioner Miller, I have a couple of questions. Um, the pipeline, is that indicated in this diagonal line across the property? That's correct. And then, um, and then I have a question for for uh, Mr. Pollock um, because you know I'm going to be in opposition of this for the sole reason that if the Navy says uh, we'd rather you not, then I'm, I tend to to you know lean you know trying in an effort to be a good neighbor and and everything that I've stood for in the past, I have to go with the Navy's recommendation. However. I do share the um, the sentiments with uh, Commissioner Dibble and with Mr. Bell and with the property owners and the developers and everybody that's involved in this project. You know, we have these lines, and we these lines are are, are is what is to dictate you know our decisions moving forward. So you know, how close is too close, and or how far is is good enough? That was a question Listen, for Ben. Yeah, this is Ben. So, yeah, you, you make a great question. How far is you know, good enough? How close? Is too close? And really, we don't have an answer unless an airplane falls out of the sky. So, um, no, once again, I, I'm going to reiterate the fact that the Navy does not direct policy or regulation in terms of zoning. We can only recommend what we would like to see done with these parcels of land. So uh, with everything that I've spoke about, about uh, existing uh, flight paths and the close proximity to the AQs, along with spill outs due to student training, um, we are going to, or I am going to recommend on the Navy's behalf that uh, we don't have the medium to high density residential area. And if this was, it, let's say they were they were asking for like an RS six or an RS four point five, or you know some sort of a single family uh, development in these areas, would would you be as concerned, um, you know, as opposed to what's being proposed here for you know pretty high density multifamily? Uh, obviously, the the lesser is better. Um, but, you know, that's definitely something that we could possibly look at uh, in terms of density levels uh, within this area. So, uh, you know, it would have to be another alternative proposal, possibly, uh, but uh, preferably, you know, one to two, one to two dwellings per acre. But, uh, of course, we would have to look at. It. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for your comments. Any other comments for staff at this time? This is Michael York. Uh, uh, question about uh, the uh, the alternative proposal presented. Is this something that that staff has had a chance to review or give comments on, or was this just put in at the last minute? No, sir. It was. Uh, this is Andrew Davis. No, nothing was at the last minute. Uh, Mr. Bell and I have had an ongoing conversation as we've been going through the preparing of the zoning case. So. Uh, like with any zoning case, we give initial feedback to the applicant 
if we feel there's a preliminary recommendation of approval or denial of a request for a change of zoning, that's to give them the heads up, of course, as we make our way to Planning Commission, that they are fully prepared to uh, defend their, their point, their, re, their request. So this alternative proposal was submitted uh, more than about a week ago, and we've had some internal discussions looking at it, uh, but we still feel, in a, again, a discussions with the Navy that uh, it is just too much density and it is inconsistent with the future land use map, first and foremost. Okay, and I don't know if this is fair to ask, but if, if does staff feel like this is close? I mean, if, if and what I'm getting at is if, if if this were tabled to the next meeting, does it do you feel or does staff feel that that they could come to some you know make some some changes to this to where staff would support it or the Navy would support it? Uh, well, the alternative proposal was the result of ongoing discussions, and so uh, that, that is why we're still sticking with the, the recommendation of denial. It's it's not that uh, we were stuck on a particular point. It, it was, one, again, inconsistency with future land use, and then, two, uh, the proximity to the APZs. So, the, I, as uh, Mr. Pollock mentioned, what what the APUS guideline states in the UDC, as well as you know that that's a that's just a mirror of the federally adopted guidelines. Uh, this area is to look for low density residential, which is between uh, one and two dwelling units per acre. So the RS22 that you see all the way to the left side of your screen, that is absolutely those are half acre lots. So those are consistent uh, with future land use. Uh, and while I completely understand Mr. Bell's point, this is you know a, a prime piece of real estate. Uh, I do have to defend our, our comprehensive plan and uh, the goals and standards set by the AQ. So that, that is why we take this staff position. Uh, of course, we did have further discussion on the CG1. The original was CG2. CG1 on a preliminary map that I saw of the, of the future land use map. So as much as we're waiting for the AQ's maps as they're coming out, there's also the changes being made as part of the Flower Bluff Area Development Plan. Uh, the jury was still out on the rest of the property, but the CG1 portion was going to change to commercial on that upcoming future land use map. So we as staff do you know, agree that the CG1, no problem. We, we recommend approval. It is the rest of the site that has the higher density of apartments. That, that's where the rub is. But, but uh, this is Vice Chairman Dibble. Just for the record, so I'm clear, and I want to get it stated you know, for the record, that this property is outside of the AQ zone, which there's nothing in the UDC that this proposed uh, zoning scheme would be contrary to. I, I mean, and, and I appreciate the Navy's position here, but really the basis of the staff recommendation doesn't have anything. That there's nothing contrary to what's in the, the UDC. It's the Navy says, I don't really want it here, even though our joint land use study says it's out of the AQ zone. And because of that, that staff is recommended denial. It's not that there's anything that's contrary to zoning patterns or, or anything that's contrary to what's in the UDC, correct? Oh, I would have only agree with a part of that statement. Uh, I think I've said about six or seven times now that it's outside of the AQs uh, for the record each time. But again, it is inconsistent with the future land use map, which is the adopted comprehensive plan that this very board adopted along with the Flyer Bluff Area Development Plan, both the former and the upcoming one, which this board will also have a chance to review. Uh, so it is inconsistent also with the surrounding neighborhoods. All the neighborhoods to the south are low density residential. So it, it is very much, in fact, not consistent with adjacent neighborhoods to the south. Okay, so, so so the basis is because it's inconsistent with the the current land use plan. Is that correct? So, as mentioned on my slide uh, a little bit earlier, the we are recommending denial based on inconsistency with future land use map, the Flower Bluff Area Development Plan, and Plan CC. The second uh, reason for denial or recommend, recommendation of denial is the proximity of the AQ. So it's not solely just because of AQs. It is uh, primarily because of inconsistency with our comprehensive plan. And then, Andrew, just one other question. In terms of um, transitional areas from 
you know, where you kind of step down zoning to get from higher density to lower density to residential. Yes, sir. Out, outside of this being inconsistent with a, a future land use plan, is there anything in this proposed zoning scheme that would be inconsistent with other step down areas that we've done in other other parts of town? I mean, generally, other than it being contrary, is this type of zoning pattern consistent with what we typically would do? Yeah, Andrew, this is actually, that's actually exactly what I was getting to with, with my question is what, what I've seen in the past is that the trend is commercial, multifamily, and it can break up residential and commercial. So it seemed like that was in line with, with some of the ways that these have been done in other areas. Um, I, I understand it may not jive with the, you know, the, the actual plan. It just shows low density residential, but does this fit with, with the trends for like, uh, Vice Chairman Dibble said, kind of stepping down from one density, one zone to another? I, I would first say that it's it's also the scale, the, the number, the amount of density. So calculate, even on this alternative proposal, calculating 615 dwelling units. And if the original proposal were to go through at purely RM2 uh, on raw acreage, that was coming out to just over a thousand units. I don't think I could name a place in the city that uh, even our HEV pluses or even other large Walmarts that are surrounded at the very next property with a thousand apartments. Uh, that would drastically impact our, uh, as uh, Commissioner of York, as you asked earlier, about the ability for infrastructure to absorb that level. So uh, at raw acreage of purely RM2 across the board, minus the commercial, that's a thousand units at maximum build out. Based on the alternative proposal, that's about half of that at 615 units. Uh, yes, I'm absolutely worried about wastewater, but I, I don't think I can, again, think of another area of the city that, yes, while we do use multifamily to buffer between single and commercial districts, I can't think of another property that has 600 units right next door, at, even at Staples and Saratoga, buffering the HEB from the surrounding neighborhood or Kohl's or any of these other shopping centers. That, that high density would have a negative impact no matter where you were in the city, regardless of AQs. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Okay, at this time, is there any other comments for staff? I know when we did the planning commission or the uh, plan TC, I was on those long nights going through that as well. And I know there was several times that it was brought up that, you know, are these dictating future development and it was more of a guideline for future development. So though it might not match exactly, uh, it was really for just helping the thought of, of directing future development. So uh, I do want to put that up there because that was discussed numerous times as well. All right, with that being said at this time, are there any other comments or any motions uh, for item seven? Yes, Commissioner Miller, I move that we deny the change of zoning as per staff and the recommendations of the Navy. At this time, do I have a second? I second it. All right, we have a motion and a second. At this time, I will call roll, please. Okay, Chairman Boss? No. Vice Chairman Dibble? Uh, no. Commissioner Schrader? Opposed. Commissioner Zarkoni? Opposed. Commissioner Miller? Aye. Commissioner York? Opposed. Commissioner Gonzalez? Opposed. Commissioner Mantell? Oh, is absent. And Commissioner Salazar Garza. Opposed. Okay. Motion does not pass. At this time, do I have another motion or further discussion? Uh, Vice or Chairman Ball, this is Dan Dibble. Um, I guess point of clarification for staff. Um, it, 
Is it okay for me to recommend making a motion to approve the alternate uh, zoning plan as presented by the applicant? Yes, uh, as uh, planning, as vice chairman or, or any planning commissioner can make that motion. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I, I guess at this time, I'd like to make that motion to approve uh, the proposed zoning uh, layout uh, as presented by the applicant and their alternative uh, plan submitted tonight. Okay. At this time, do I have a second to approve the alternate plan as uh, included in the package? This is Commissioner Schrader. I'll second that motion. All right. This time we'll roll call, please. Sure, Chairman Boss. Aye. Vice Chairman Dibble. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Zarkini. Opposed. Commissioner Miller. Opposed. Commissioner York. Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez. Aye. Commissioner Mandel is absent and Commissioner Salazar Barza. Commissioner Mayor opposed. Motion passes. Okay, and uh, just to clarify, as we always do uh, on these cases, uh, it is up for, um, uh, you know, basically we're a recommending body, so it's still up for approval at the uh, City Council, I believe. All righty, moving on to item eight. I believe we have Avery on the line from our uh, planning department who's gonna walk us through uh, tonight's presentation. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Uh, as he said, my name is Avery Oltmans with the city's planning department. Uh, this issue is to deal with an amendment to our UTP plan, uh, the shift of a beach access road um, to uh, slightly to the north of its current location. We can move to the next slide, please. So here is a simple map to show the location of the UTP. That is the red dash dot uh, line and the proposed shift is the black and white dash dot. And those arrows that you see indicate the proposed shifting movement. Can we go to the next slide, please? Here's another view meant to uh, highlight a little more clearly there, uh, the proposed development area for which this amendment is being put forward. Uh, this is that darker colored area that sits between uh, the Highway 361 and the um, Gulf Beach Road. Uh, it is comprised of Puerto Village. Yeah, uh, Puerto Village, which is the partially developed uh, fourth uh, on the, of, this, of that area to the south, and then three undeveloped lots um, that uh, comprise the remainder of that site. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, application was submitted uh, by Urban Engineering on behalf of the applicant. As I said, the, um, the development as being cited includes the majority of Porto Village, which has been purchased uh, by the developer, as well as the three adjoining parcels uh, that all are adjacent to one another to the north. Um, the reason, the, or the immediate rationale for proposal of moving that line was to have this, uh, the UTP, the, um, excuse me, the C1 Beach SX Road be located on the edge of the property rather than splitting that property in two. Um, and then uh, lastly here, we wanted to point out um, initial uh, evaluation of this site indicated that the current location of our UTP road, this again is that proposed C1 to be moved, its current location would impact known wetlands and the proposed shift would uh, help to mitigate and minimize uh, impact to area wetlands. And uh, can I get to the next slide? Staff recommends approval. Um, I can take any questions. 
And maybe if you would please, oh, sorry, just let's go. Yeah, perfect. You're right ahead of me. So any questions? Thank you for the presentation. Any questions from Planning welcome. Commission at this time? This is Commissioner Schrader. Uh, those properties that are, um, uh, I think that says Mustang Island Estate Drive that are just uh, to the north, those appear to be already platted uh, and they're, they're resident. They're basically residential lot size to back up to this this new uh, proposed right away. Does that impact those properties as far as creating uh, greater uh, setbacks and things than what they? Uh, how, how does how does that impact those properties? I guess. Yeah, the 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 C one property. Or sorry, the C one roadway, as we all know, calls for the sixty foot of right of way. My understanding is that that 60 foot is going to be located within the proposed development, or at least we haven't had a plat yet, but uh, that that is the understanding that the uh, the C1 roadway is going to um, be located within the proposed development per this area that you're talking about. Um, so as it passes through between uh, the highway and the beach, uh, that there would be minimal, if any, uh, impact to those northern properties okay and have those uh in in this type of process that we're talking about here are they notified like they are in a zoning case or how how do they how are they aware of this this situation uh, my understanding is that they would need to avail themselves of this process that we're going through now obviously we go through the process of op opening public hearings um through the planning commission uh we're going to go to the uh Transportation Advisory Commission um, later this month. And then, of course, uh, there'll be two options for public hearing uh, in the month of May uh, for City Council. Um, outside of that, we don't have a, a mechanism by way to uh, notify folks who um, are not involved in the areas that are impacted. Okay, but in other words, these immediate adjacent properties along this uh, uh, Mustang Island Estate Drive, they receive a mailed notice or similar to uh, properties that adjoin uh, a, a um, zoning case? No, they do not. They do not. They do okay. not. No. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for staff? All right. At this time, I will open the public hearing regarding item eight. Are there any comments from public? Uh, no, sir. No comments from development services, nor did we receive any by mail, of course. Great. I will close the public hearing and entertain additional conversation or a approval or motion, rather. Sorry. Uh, at this time, I will make a motion that we approve uh, item eight as presented. What's Michael York? I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you for that. Moving on to the director's report. Thanks, everybody. Snyder Nixon Mendes, assistant director, and there's no report for this evening. Thank you. Are there any other items to be uh, scheduled for future agendas? Chairman Ball, this is Vice Chairman Dimble. Just a question for staff. Kind of on the the previous item, uh, uh, in terms of public notification, this has come up, you know, a couple of times, maybe since I've been on the commission. I remember we had a zoning case on Yorktown where uh, property was having to be rezoned because when the initial land use map was done, it, it wasn't annexed in the city yet, and then they didn't didn't know where they had an improper use. In this case, we've got landowners that are, you know, adjacent to this property that aren't receiving notice. What would be the mechanism to, I mean, I'm sure we followed policy, otherwise it wouldn't have been presented the way it is, but I mean, I guess how, I don't know how the public or an adjacent landowner is gonna know that there's this change in plan. I mean, if, if we wanted to, notify landowners what would be the mechanism to do that would that require a udc change or i mean 
Uh, I mean, I know there's a series of public notices, but again, they may or may not ever know, you know, without receiving some kind of notification from the city. What, how, how could we change that if we wanted to? Yes, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, this is Andrew Demas with Development Services. Absolutely, a UDC text amendment would be the appropriate mechanism to establish a publication and a mail notice uh, requirement. So in Article 3 of our code lists all of our procedural steps that mirror, for the most part, state statute, but we do have local amendments. For instance, uh, state statute doesn't necessarily go into too much detail on what kind of signage has to be posted, but we have specific steps for putting up signage for a zoning case. Okay. Very similarly, uh, there could be a line established within that code, within that section of the UDC to say that any amendment to the urban transportation plan must be, you know, mailed within an X amount of radius around the subject property or properties that front along the proposed change. Uh, but it would, uh, to answer you, the short answer is that it is a UDC text amendment. Uh, I, I guess I'd like to maybe recommend that uh, if y'all could just put this item on your list and maybe the next time you're looking at text amendments for that section of the UDC to, to, to maybe research that because I think um, um, anything we can do to notify, especially adjacent property owners on something like this, um, you know, I think we're just doing the public a service on, on taking that extra step to make sure they're informed on what's going on. Yes, sir. I'm making a note of it right now. I agree. Thank you for the yeah. I, I I echo Dan's sentiments. You know, we have whenever there's a request or a request for zoning change, we've got a two by three little yellow sign with tiny text on it. And, you know, I think it should be a, a big sign with some sort of a link to to for, for further or an access a way to access further information of what exactly is being proposed and, um, you know, for, for zoning cases and changes to the UTP and everything else. Thank you. Andrew, could you note that as well? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, you, you read our minds. We're, uh, I was looking at, we're running a little bit low on zoning signs. So now is the time that we're discussing the next order batch uh, internally and the only and, and you're not the first to bring this up several council members have brought up the same sentiments uh the question is finding the magic number to where you know we don't live in the uh most windiest environment for a reason so it's finding the magic number on the size of the sign so the wind doesn't take the sign off and you're making it too big now that it turns into a sale so we're we're working on the dimensions to find that happy kind of balance can you put some balloons on it andrew <laughs> I would be more than happy to. That's great. Thank well, thank you all for your comments. Anything else at this time for Planning Commission? If not, I will talk to you all in two weeks. Thank you much. The meeting is, uh, is adjourned. Thank you. Have a great evening.